welcome to the SaaS Revolution Show. I'm your host, Alex Humer, uh, delighted to be joined today for the first time by Dave Kellogg, uh, who is the author uh, of Kellblog and executive in residence at Balderton Capital. Uh, welcome, Dave. Thanks. Welcome back, Alex. How are you doing? Yeah, no, good, good. You, you know, I'm excited about 2023. I know there's like, I think as 2022 was coming to an end, there's a lot of negative, negatively framed content about, and, and rightly so, about what's coming up and the upcoming recession and a lot of doom and gloom out there. But I personally have leapt in to 2023 in a, in a really good place. And I'm very excited about this. And yeah, so uh, that, that's where I'm at. And, and also, I think from a, from a health place as well, David, like the last quarter really kind of took it out of me especially like in the run up to Dublin, I was very run down and, and it took a while to kind of, you know, kick everything. And I, I feel like I'm coming back to uh, my, my, my full health, which uh, also kind of helps probably with, with the state of mind and my, my positivity kind of right now, because it, it, it was a bit of a slog uh, last quarter. So uh, yeah, thanks for asking. Feeling good. Looking forward to the year. How about you? Uh, doing well. I'll, I'll be coming on the 2023 thing because uh, I'm with you. I the thing I like about downturns is they force companies to make hard decisions. And at the end, people don't like to make hard decisions. So, so downturns can actually be very, very good for companies. So I'm excited about that. One of my themes is, is how can we emerge stronger than we went in? Um, so I think this, you know, it's an opportunity. Yes, it's a problem, but it's also an opportunity to, to really sharpen our focus, right? Improve our execution, upgrade our team. There's a bunch of things we can do. So that's why I'm excited about 2023. I, I agree with you. There's too much. Uh, whatever the word is, dark content <laughs> yeah, out there. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I like that. I like we have to frame this in a, in, in a positive way. And, and so, Dave, I know it's, it's nice and early. It's 7 a.m. You're on the West Coast. And uh, have you always been based on the West Coast? No, I'm from New York originally. Came out here to go okay. to school, and I've moved around a couple times since. Very cool. Well, tell, tell the audience, Dave, you, you know, if, if they haven't heard of you before, then perhaps <laughs> – they're not founders in SaaS. So I, I would assume that they have, but we live in a bubble and we, we, we can't make assumptions. So for those that are listening, who is Dave Kellogg? Sure. So I'm a career enterprise software person. I view myself as a marketer because most of my passion and experience is in marketing. And I've been CMO of three companies from zero dollars to a billion and everything in between. So kind of crazy. Uh, on the scaling and marketing. I've been CEO of two companies as well. So, so, but, but I feel that CEOs always grew up somewhere. Like, like unless you're a founder, kind of no one was born to be a CEO. You, you worked your way up in sales or marketing or product or engineering. So I view myself as kind of a marketing guy uh, who happened to have also 10 years of CEO experience, uh, all in enterprise software. And, and now I sit on boards and do consulting and advising, some of which with, with Balderton. And, but, but, Basically, but my short pitch is I have 10 years in the CMO chair, 10 years in the CEO chair, and I've sat on 10 boards. <laughs> so I think I have a pretty good, almost 360-degree view uh, of the C-suite of a SaaS startup. What do you prefer? Did you prefer your 10 years as CMO or 10 years as CEO? Yeah, that's a great question. So the short answer is CMO for two different reasons. Maybe three. One is I think it's just my true passion area. I, I, I do love marketing. Um, you, you'll discover that as you already know, but it, it'll come out again in the podcast. The other is CEO is a very hard job. And, and I would argue, and this may sound like self-pity, but the hired CEO is harder than founder CEO because you get a shorter leash. I, I, I joke that founder CEOs have an invisibility cloak. <laughs> like when, when the crap hits the fan, they can kind of wrap themselves in the Harry Potter invisibility cloak and, and avoid all the bullets flying in the boardroom. That's harder for a hired CEO because, like it or not, the tendency tends to be, ah, we could just get another one. You know, we got this guy. He was pretty good. He or she took us from this size to that size. Let's get another person to take us from you know, size, size Y to size Z. So I do think it puts a little more pressure. You could argue that just came from me. It's possible it did, but I certainly felt that. So, so it made the job harder. And, it, you know, all the, the, the tropes about the CEO job being lonely, it is. You have no peers. Whereas as a CMO, you have peer group. I have good buddies who I'm still in touch with from 20 years ago. Right? You literally have a bunch of friends at a business objects where I did my longest stint. I mean, I'm still friends with most of those people. So, so I would say the CMO is a more fun job than CEO. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I'm obviously I'm I'm CEO of SaaS Doc, but the things I love doing is marketing, 
and uh, really it's kind of like my sweet spot. And that's how that's how Sasslock started. Really, kind of you know building an audience, doing a blog, you know, podcast, you, you know, and uh, let's say the, the the rest was history. Outside of enterprise software and SaaS, what are you interested in? What do you do? Like any hobbies, Dave? Are you, are you kind of like fully consumed by the world of SaaS? Yeah, I'd say first, first I am quite consumed by the world of SaaS because uh, I'm notionally retired, but working way more than 40 hours a week. So, so I do this because I have three different jobs and I love it all. And it's great. So, so SaaS does take a lot of my time and I really enjoy doing it. Outside of that, I do like the outdoors a lot. So, so I like hiking. I like I fly fish. Uh, on, a, on a different day, you might have caught me in my house in Bend, Oregon, which is a beautiful place in the Pacific Northwest where the outdoors is all around you, and it's nice. So, so I think the outdoors is the short answer. Uh, SAS and the outdoors. Lovely, lovely. Yeah, I mean, f- personally, I want to do more of the outdoors stuff. Like, it's it's just not uh, currently in my life, uh, but needs to be there. So, uh, we we may share s- a similar life paths in SAS and and the outdoors. Uh, you know, being uh, something that we do, but uh, yeah, definitely being more in nature is something that I aspire to be. So, I, I need to work on that. And so you're the author of Kel Blog. How long has that been going on? Why did you start it? You know, what is it? So Kel Blog started, I believe, in 2005, I mean, a long time ago for, for a blog. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I started it when I was CEO of a company called MarkLogic, which sold an XML database system. And we sold it half, 50% plus of our business was media companies who were being attacked by Google, trying to figure out how to repackage and monetize their content uh, in, the th- in the threat of a massive, in the face of a massive existential threat in Google. So I started the blog to walk in their shoes. I mean, I love, as a marketing person, I love deeply understanding my customers. And, and the more I could understand about this new medium, blogging, I thought the, the better for me in working with those customers. So I actually started it. It was originally called the Mark Logic CEO blog. At some point, uh, Sequoia was an investor in Mark Logic. And Mike Moritz walked up to me and went, oh, it's Mr. Kell blog. <laughs> I was like, oh, that could be a really fun <laughs> name for it. And it, the other thing we haven't talked about yet is I'm, I'm a Francophile. I lived in France for five years. And it's a great, I think it's called homophone or homonym. Uh, that Kell blog in French means what a blog. So it's kind of an accidental oh, right. joke as well. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. So, so yeah, I started it to walk in my customers' footsteps. And over time, it evolved because I, I liked writing essays about software and sharing, sharing the lessons I had. I, I, I love to generalize and structure problems. It's just kind of in my nature. And that's what Kellblog became. The other thing that Kellblog was really good for is when I found a topic I didn't know much about was interested, when you commit to write a post, right, you force yourself to learn it. So th- that's kind of how I got started. Amazing. And, and so 18, if my math is correct, 18 years you, you've been doing it. And do you know, I mean, off the top of your head, how many posts, how many blogs have you, have you written over that time? Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a, and on the blog today, there's around 800 posts. Uh, I delete okay. some from time to time, so I've probably written close to 900. And we've got about, it's hard to figure out the audience, but, but there's a, roughly 20,000 subscribers directly. Uh, and then there's other people who follow it indirectly, like via WordPress, and I do a lot of publication on Twitter. Uh, et cetera. So, so yeah, about 800 posts. Average post is a couple thousand words. They're long, mm-hmm. right? Kevlog, yeah. I, I never did the whole, I tried. I mean, this is a good example of walking in customer's shoes. There was a time they said, do short blog posts frequently, right? That was better for SEO. Yeah. And, and I tried it for a little bit, but it just wasn't me. So I, I flipped back to the more, the more Paul Graham model of infrequent long essays. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Well, big, big fan over here. And obviously the Kel blog is uh, pretty much, you know, how, uh, well, I, I am, we sort of, you know, discovered you and, you know, been reading and, and, and luckily for us post COVID, uh, we managed to get you to, uh, to come over to Dublin and, and speak at Sassock in Dublin in October, which was great. And uh, coming up this year, uh, we know that you'll be coming to speak at Sassock USA, you know, end, end of May, beginning of June as well. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So, so, so very excited about that. But also apart from Kel blog, you're now executive in residence at Balderton What's the story behind that? How did that come about? Because obviously, uh, Balderton are really, uh, I would say, like European venture capital firm. You're on the West Coast, but you're obviously a SaaS, you, you know, aficionado and expert and, you, you know, marketing and expert. So how, how did this come about? So, so the, the, the managing partner at Balderton is a guy named Bernard Liotto, who is the founder and CEO of Business Objects. So I work for Bernard either directly or indirectly or exchange over nine years. 
for nine years uh, during my stint at, at Business Objects. So I know, I know Bernard quite well. He floated the idea at some point. You know, at Business Objects, I lived in Paris for five years. So, so I've helped European companies get established in the U.S. And, and that is a, it's a major strategic challenge that almost no U.S. VC can help you with, right? You can get, I mean, the, the money is all green, right? So, so at least America it is. <laughs> so you could get money from uh, a West Coast or a New York venture capitalist as a European company. That happens. But when you say, how do I think about U.S. expansion? They literally, definitionally have no experience because they were born there. So, so it's a little bit like, you know, Americans don't know how hard it is to learn English as a second language because mm-hmm. they, they never had to, right? <laughs> So it's the same thing. So I, I, I always felt I had a set of skills. You know, I speak reasonably good French as well, so it helps me with French companies, and I certainly understand French culture. So uh, cause my wife is French, so I've got personal lessons for 30 years in French culture. But uh, I felt like I understood Europe better than your average American. Like business subjects, our onboarding program was in Paris, and I would say 30 40% of the time people had to get passports to attend. Right. They didn't have a passport, right? So, so certainly average, better than the average bear, American and understanding Europe. And I had those skills for business objects in U.S. expansion. And I have a certain passion for working for the European and or French companies. I was the board of Nuxio, a French company, where we helped them with those issues. So I, I like using what I think are unique skills that I have. So, so Bernard said, hey, why don't you try doing this, basically a part-time gig advising portfolio companies? And I was like, yeah, this sounds fun. Yeah, I've been doing it now about 18 months. Very cool. And so in terms of advising, you, you know, can you give like any examples, uh, you, you know, what that would look like for the companies, I guess, or w- within the Balderton uh, por- um, portfolio? Yeah, it's all over the map, to be honest. Uh, I'll just give you some examples. I help one company uh, find a new chief commercial officer. So you look at the spec, you talk to the recruiting firm, you help them filter candidates, you do a couple of interviews. So, so that's one because, you know, your typical founder today is a product oriented founder. So they know a lot about product. They grew up in product. They know, know a bit about engineering. They may know a bit about product marketing, right? All, this, all the stuff that hangs out around product. But they don't know so much about, you know, go-to-market sales compensations plans, positioning. So I tend to help. I mean, the generic pattern is help product-oriented founders with commercial issues. Sometimes it's positioning, like, like just looking at their current materials, looking at the competition, and saying, you know, this doesn't really sound different or it does sound different or... One of my favorite questions, do you know if the buyer cares about this? <laughs> right, might be super clear, but do we have any research that says that anyone actually cares? So it could be product positioning. It could be team structure. Once in a while, it's comp plans. A lot of the work is also marketing. How do I structure a marketing department? Who do I hire? How do I measure them? What do I count? A very important metric about marketing, right? Like, do I count leads or opportunities or pipeline or, you know, all those sorts of questions. So but I would say it's, it's pretty broad. The other thing I help with is board relations. I, I think the other thing that's really hard about the CEO job and, and is you, you don't have a boss. And, and if, you're, if you found that a company really young, maybe that's fine because you're not used to it. But, but I, I climbed the corporate ladder, right? My first job was tech support. So, so, yeah. so I was taking phone calls on how to write SQL queries in 1980-something. And, and I worked my way over to marketing and, and eventually executive leadership. But... That whole time, you're working for a boss. You learn how to work for a boss, and all of a sudden, you're not. And I think one of the most common mistakes that profile of CEO makes is they treat the board like a boss. And that, that it's completely wrong. It scares everybody. So, so I sometimes will help people with stuff like that. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. So recently-ish, I mean, when was it? I think November, you, or you can clarify, but you wrote The Founder's Guide to B2B Sales. So it was a couple of months back? Yeah, uh, I think we put it out probably, <laughs> I started writing it in like April. It was a big project, yeah. but I think we launched it in November, yeah. Uh, very cool. And so let, let's go through that uh, a, a little bit. I guess kind of like, why did you write it? And then tell us a little bit about it, you, you know, and, and maybe some of the key takeaways uh, uh, for the listeners. Yeah, so I think we wrote it because, well, we, we like to put out, I mean, part of my job, in addition to the advising, is to putting out some content. And we wanted to put out a seminal piece of content. They had an existing B2B sales guide. It was good, but it was created, I think, in May 2020. It was getting a little bit old. And the pro- it actually started out, I think, the initial conversation was, okay, let's go revise that. And once I got into it, I decided I wanted to look at it through a different angle. And that's actually reflected by the title. That's what's called a founder's guide to B2B sales. 
because because the first question I had was who's who's the audience? Who am I writing this for? Am I writing it for the CRO? Am I writing it for the CEO? Like because I'm going to write it differently, right? Depending on who you tell me the audience is, and I kind of landed on the founder, this this product oriented founder, because you know your average SaaS company spends twice as much on sales and marketing as it does on R and D, and and I think that's very uncomfortable position for a product oriented founder, right? <laughs> it's like I'm a product person running running a distribution business, and I don't know much about that. So that's who it's written for. It's really written for the product-oriented founder who finds themselves running <laughs> this business that spends twice as much energy on distribution than it does on product development, and, and that's unfamiliar territory. So this walks through it in a kind of very analytical, quantitative kind of a, you know, I was a math and geophysics major, kind of a math person, programmer person mindset, right? It's very structured, yeah. it's very analytical to say, okay, I know where you're coming from. I came from there too, and here's how I learned sales. So, so that was really the intent. Awesome. Well, t- take us through, uh, so understand the intent, maybe sort of like some of the key uh, takeaways then, you know, from that. Sure. I think we hit one already, which was the audience. And, and I think that was, mm-hmm. as with any marketing deliverable, always start with the audience. People always start, yep. people always start with what they have left over, right? Uh, oh, I've got some slides here. Let's use those. And I always say, don't do that. Start with a blank sheet of paper and think about your audience. And and I almost started with the old playbook and just revised it. And instead I said, no, 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 got to do what I preach, blank piece of paper. And when I took the blank piece of paper out, I decided to to basically structure the thing and do it. It's around 10 sections. The very first is just on what you need to know about selling, right? We always say this founder CEO should be the best salesperson. And and that may or may not come naturally. Often it doesn't. (laughs) So, So what do you need to know about you personally selling in front of customers? And... I think that that chapter alone, if you're a product oriented founder, just read that and you will get an enormous amount of value because it distills, I mean, it distills what could easily have been a book on sales or multiple books on sales down to seven points. It's just like, here are the seven things you actually really need to know and do that. So once we say, hey, I've taught you how to sell personally, because you're going to need to do that. And these are important skills to have. And by the way, you, you, if you want to raise money, the VCs are going to ask you, how much do you meet with customers? What do they tell mm. you? And if your answer is, I never meet them, only the VP of sales does, you know, that's a problematic answer, in my opinion. Some VCs may be okay with it, but like, hmm, to me, I get <laughs> yellow what, flag. What, what is your thought in terms of you know, a founder? So you've just launched a SaaS business. Like how many customers or like how long or to what ARR should they be selling you, you know, and learning you know, to their customers? One, I mean, just anecdotally, I spoke to Saravana Kumar. He was on the podcast, bootstrapped to north of 10 million ARR. I'm not sure what the duration is. I think it, it could have been 10 years or so. But he told me that he, he did the first 1,000 product demos. And this was over you know, a, couple of, uh, a couple of years before he eventually relinquished and you know, kind of hired somebody. But obviously, he learned huge amounts from that. It's, that sounds like a lot. And I've heard you, you know, less, and I've heard that you've got to do it for 18 months or 12 months. But what's the Dave Kellogg you know, and Balderson view of like, you know, how long a founder should be leading sales? Yeah, I'll give you the Dave Kellogg view because, um, as you know, Balderson does a lot more than just SaaS. I guess it's around 20%, 30% of the portfolio. So yeah. uh, I'm kind of the SaaS guy at Balderson for EIRs. Uh, my view is it's probably a couple of million in ARR. Uh, you know, the, basically, when do you transition from founder-led sales to sales-led sales? And, and certainly the first 10 customers, I think, almost independent of anything is kind of founder-led sales. And then, then the question is, what's, what's your scaling model going to be? My, I'll just tell you my favorite scaling model. So I think you sell the first handful of customers. Uh, and then once you're sure, you're like, hey, People are buying this. I think I've got something here. Like, like it, it, you're finding some notion of repeatability. Like people react the same way to your pitch. There's nothing quantitative, but like what I call this title and say this thing, they kind of nod their head and then they want to do a trial and, and they, they buy it. And if you see that pattern, th- that's probably the indicator that you should hire someone, a professional salesperson, right? And, and my favorite model for doing that, and I'm not sure this is actually in the guide, is you very early on get a first or second level sales manager, not someone who's currently a VP of sales, because that's kind of too highfalutin. You you get somebody who's a first or second line sales manager, and you say, I want you to lock elbows with me for one year, and you and I are going to sell every deal, maybe maybe six months, but six months, six to 12 months. 
So you're going to have this massive knowledge transfer over six months between the founder and that sales head. And then because that sales head has the experience of management, you know they can scale the team for you. Because too often, you'll do that knowledge transfer to somebody who's just an individual seller, and then you can't leverage it. It's like, like we've done 100 sales calls together. We've done 100 demos together. I want you to go build a team. And the person's like, I never built a team. <laughs> so, so that's my favorite model. Yeah. And, and in that model, it means the founder is doing it for quite some time. It's probably a year, but they're doing it with this person locked next to them because they're actually training them. So the, the founders led the sales, let's say, you know, either more than a year and like to two million ARR. They, they brought in, you know, this first salesperson or somebody that's kind of already been there, but has a little bit of this management experience to build it out. You know, what next? You know, what do they need to do next? Yeah, so in my mind, you know, good habits start early. <laughs> so, so if I could get a startup, catch them right at that phase, I would say we're going to define a lot more process than you need right now. But it's going to be, I mean, metrics are a reflection of process, right? They measure processes. So if you're constantly changing the process, the metric may have the same name, but it may not actually be comparable. Simple example, if you define stage two opportunity one way and a new VP of sales defines stage two opportunity another way, all the, all the cost per stage to opportunity, all the conversion rate analysis, right? It's all garbage, right? Garbage in, garbage out, because we don't have a consistent definition of stage two opportunity. And this happens all the time with startups. So my opinion is process is a bit like railroad tracks. Let, let's lay it down, <laughs> and then we can run the train over it. So, so that's what I would say. I would say, let's, let's kind of define how we want to run our sales team for the next two years. Uh, and say, what meetings are we going to have, right? We're going to have pipeline scrubs at what frequency? Are we going to have forecast meetings at what frequency? How often are we going to present the forecast? Are we going to have deal reviews with, with what process? How are we going to define the basics in our CRM? So what are the most important fields that always have to be done, like forecast category or stage or close date? How do we, standards for how we enter? If the customer says, uh, I want to buy in July, but you think you might be able to pull the deal up to June, how do I put that in the CRM? Is that a July close date or a June close date? Um, how do I classify opportunities, forecast, upside, pipeline? So all that stuff. And if you've done it before, it's not hard, right? And this is why you want to hire that second-line sales manager because they're like, okay, we could take a, you know, a couple days and write this stuff down. And then every person we bring on board, we teach them that. And then we're doing it the standard way. I got to tell you one story because this is truly crazy. When I was at Salesforce in 2012, we hired a new head of, I think it was Asia Pac, And that person... And I may be screwing up the story slightly, so let's just say a new regional head. It may not have been Asia Pack. And, and that person basically said, I want you to put deals of the CRM at your aspirational value. So if I put it in for 200K, it'd be like, Dave, is that all you can get from this customer? Could you get more? And I'm like, no, I think I could get 400K. And it's like, put 400K in, right? And this is kind of a sales management trick that's it's kind of an old school sales trick, right? To get you to put in a big number and then beat the, you know, the heck out of you to say, well, why is this only 300K? You know? <laughs> uh, so... It, so, but whether you like to practice or not, all of a sudden the Australia pipeline doubled, right? And nobody at corporate knew what was going on. So, so I'm sitting next to all the, the, the MBAs because <laughs> uh, they had a pretty big quant team at the time. And we're like, wow, Australia's on fire. The pipeline's doing amazing. We, you know, all our numbers are off, right? And eventually yeah. they found out why. It was because somebody effectively, without really knowing they did it, changed the definition of how to value an opportunity. Right? And that was a $3 billion company. And it, it jammed all the metrics for like two quarters before we figured it out. So yeah. this is why you want to put the stuff in place early and never change it. What about, I mean, within the guide, you, you know, is there anything around you know, building out that kind of like sales playbook and the repeatability, you, you know, because often these things, you know, scaling the go-to-market, it, it is about, you know, building out these repeatable processes and you know, getting a playbook uh, in, in place. So where, at what stage is, is this coming in from that, you know, that first salesperson hire they're building this in and you know figuring out what works what doesn't work and and then building out the team from there yeah we do that we discuss repeatability right and repeatability it's it's kind of this holy grail or everyone talks about it but they don't know what it is right it's you know got to have repeatability do you have repeatability and you know, investment decisions get made on whether or not somebody thinks you have repeatability. So it's super important yeah. to be able to convince people that you have repeatability. But, but very few people kind of say, well, what is it again? And like, how do I know when I have it? To me, my, my basic definition for an early stage startup of repeatability is 
sell what to whom to solve which problem? And if you have consistent answers to those questions, let's, uh, I ran a company called Host Analytics. What did we sell? We sold a planning and budgeting system. Who did we sell it to? The head of financial planning and analysis. To solve what problem? The preparation of annual budgets and the preparation of monthly and quarterly performance reporting. Right? That, that's pretty well defined. Oh, by the way, at companies above $50 million in revenue and probably less than $2 billion. Right? And, and once you have that, or, or anything approximating it, right? then to me, you're getting the essence of repeatability. Then you can add layers, like who should sell it to them? Like, should we hire people from other, like, do, have we discovered over time that the most successful salespeople are actually ones we grew up in-house out of an SDR recruiting program and promotion, or are they veterans from other EPM companies, blah, blah, blah. So, so you can add layers to repeatability, but the core of repeatability is sell what to whom to do what. And we definitely talk about that. So, so once you start, and a lot of companies don't have that, by the way, and that will kill you in the early days, right? You kind of get drawn and quartered by your customers because they're, they're in four different types, and they all want, you know, I always say it, it's great until the first user group, and then you say, hey, what does everybody want in the next release? <laughs> and every customer runs a different direction, and that's a nightmare if you're in product management, right? Because the PM wants all the customers to go, we all want this, and then, and then their job is much easier. So what do you, yep, they're going. Karen, oh, I was just going to talk about scale-up. After we do that, because yeah. you asked about scale-up, yeah, there's a whole yep. bunch of things about how scaling. A lot of the scaling comes down to getting the basics right in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. And then it comes to more tactical stuff like how do we build and overlay sales models? How do we think about quotas? Basically, how, do, how do we get into actually managing that sales force, forecasting? How do we run a quarterly business review? I mean, we literally cover, I, I think this thing's good to at least 100 million and maybe well beyond in terms of how, how long you could run a sales force with this guide. I was going to ask you, because I would say in the last week, I've probably spoken to three founders and probably countless in the, in, in the past where they've relied really on inbound, you know, initially, and they've gotten to maybe like 10 million ARR just on inbound, and they haven't really tried outbound but when when they have and they started to invest in it all of a sudden they've really kind of started to take off and so my thoughts on that and again not being i've never run a SaaS company but it's like well if, if people are really seeing the results of outbound should they not bring it in earlier you know and and, and what stage when is the right time and and i guess it, it probably you know is, is the answer it depends but yeah. i'm going to ask you that so like yeah. why why don't founders bring in outbounds you, you know from the get-go when when should they be doing it so my, my first principle here is that that uh sales are like airplanes and, and they only make money when they're flying right so so sales only make money when they're in the air so so if they're if they're prospecting or because that's not flying, right? That, that's taxiing or something else, right? So, so I want salespeople in the air selling. So I want to keep them really busy. Inbound is a great way to do that, right? Um, this goes all the way back to a book by Jason Lemkin, Predictable Revenue, right? And, and that was, to me, that book defined the industrialization of sales. And industrialization is about specialization and repeatability. So I like salespeople in the air. Now, a lot of sales managers disagree with that. Like, they'll agree with it, but say, but they should generate 10% of their own pipeline. Or, but, you know, they need to do this many opties per month. And some of that is because of character building. You know, the old trope that I had to walk to school uphill both ways when I was a child, you know. <laughs> so, so you need to, right? I needed to do prospecting when I was a salesperson, so you need to, even if the, the whole world has changed and there's no real logical reason for that. Sometimes it's just character building. Sometimes it's, a def it's a, actually a, a defense strategy So because salespeople are notoriously hard to manage, right? They're, they're kind of vocal complainers. So if they don't have yeah. enough pipeline, a sales manager wants to be able to say, well, you're, you're on the hook for 20%. What are you doing to help yourself, right? If it's a 100% inbound model, they can't do that, right? So some people do it for that reason. And then finally, the good reason to do it is, in my opinion, ABM, where I'm giving you a small set of targeted accounts that I want you to crack. So the question to me is, I don't like outbound in and of itself, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of a means to an end. And, 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 you know, I've worked with companies at 50, even 100 billion that are still 90% plus inbound. And, and there, there can be problems with that. But in my mind, they're, they're getting the first principle correct, which is their, their airplanes are in the air, right? They're, there's not a lot of planes sitting on the ground. Like if you're just handing salespeople qualified opportunities and they're selling. So, so to me, I like that. I get goosebumps. But the, so the real question to me is how do we keep salespeople selling? And outbound is a great way to do it if you're trying to target accounts. So let me give you an example where I would not use outbound. If you have a 5K deal size and a totally horizontal product, 
the the, uh, the juice isn't worth the squeeze, right? I mean, outbound is expensive. Yeah. You have to do a lot of work to build customized messaging, targeted marketing, and, and look for for a couple hundred k deal for a half million dollar deal all day long. I, I would do that. Absolutely yeah. worth it. Or to crack a lighthouse account, do it all day long, right? To try and win a vertical. But but so so to me, it's all about a coherent sales model. So I tend not to be religious about it, about their outbound. It's like, hey, tell me about your situation. Awesome. Uh, thanks for sharing that. So if people want to read, uh, I say it's, it's a very comprehensive guide. So if they want to read the Founder's Guide to B2B Sales, where can they go to access it? Sure. It's on uh, ballerton.com. So I think it's slash playbooks. Uh, you'll find it there. You can also find a link to it on Kelblog. So if you just saw, if you did B- Ballerton B2B Founder's Guide, Kelblog, or even Kelblog B2B Sales, that'll be a good Google search. It, it'll pop up and uh, take you to the guide. We're, we're awesome. soon to release a PDF version, by the way. People always ask about that. Right now, it's only online. We're, in the, we're very close to putting out a PDF yeah. so you can download it. Awesome. And we'll also drop a link to it on the, uh, the show notes as well. Moving into the quickish fire round here, Dave, I'd like to know what one thing has moved the needle for, uh, the most for you in your career. I think I'd say being deeply passionate about winning, which, which may sound like a silly answer, but, but I, when I look back at the business object experience, and you know, we grew from 30 million to a billion and won our market in that time frame. And, and to me, the, the only thing I could find, like what does everybody have in common, is that whole team just wanted to win. It wasn't about the money, right? Everyone made a lot of money, but it wasn't why, because people kept working well after they made a lot of money. Mm. So... I think it's, you really have to want to win. And, and this is a contrarian viewpoint. It is about beating competition. There's way too many people always saying, follow you, true North Star, ignore the competition. And I would say that, you know, those comments are the luxury of retired executives on Montana ranches, right? If you're trying to build a company, you have competitors and you need to figure out how to beat them. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that. I like that a lot. What's the best advice you've ever received? Well, make a plan that you can beat. And that was uh, from Mike Moritz again. He's two for two. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. And a, a great person to get advice from uh, uh, as well. Not many would have had the pleasure. What's the biggest failure you've made and lesson learned? Biggest failure is, uh, the story is long, but I'll tell you the pattern. There are some bells you cannot unring. So there's certain things you say. Just to give an example, if, if a CEO walks into a board meeting and goes, I think we should sell this company because all the macro trends are against us. You can't unring that bell. If the board goes, no, we disagree. Because <laughs> the, they're like, oh, God, the CEO doesn't believe in the future of the company. Right? So you have to be very careful. I, I always say there's a reason that corporate development people talk so slowly. <laughs> and it's because like, when you're doing these billion-dollar deals, you can't say something wrong. Because they're all yeah. super smart type A people. Right? But, but you can't unring some bells. So be very careful. The CEO, and the higher you are in the organization, the more you need to be careful. I'm going to change this last question because you said you prefer the CMO role to CEO. So what SaaS company do you wish you were CMO of if, uh, if you weren't doing what you were doing? Oh, that's, that's a really hard question. Too many customers. I think it would be indiscreet to answer. <laughs> I, I could give you the profile, though. I won't totally swing. It would be one where yeah. the CEO understands marketing and is supportive of it. I, I think it's almost impossible if the CEO doesn't understand marketing and empower the CMO. Like you need marketing to work in a functional environment and you, you need the CEO to create that environment for you. You can't, some, you can help create it, but you can't create it yourself. This, this doesn't need to be necessarily a, a, a quickish answer here, Dave, but we mentioned a little bit about, you know, the doom and gloom and sort of negativity about, you know, recession, the, the markets in SaaS, you know, headwinds, et cetera. I want to understand your take from it. And obviously you said you, you, you do have an optimistic take on it, but if you're a zero to 10 SaaS company, what, what should be, uh, you know, what's it going to be like for you 2023? What should you be doing? And if you're, you know, a scale up also, you know, what is your perspective, you know, around that for those that are listening? Sure. So, so, so two, two things on this, because uh, it's a topic I'm actively working on, because I'm doing a webinar for Balderton on January 24th called How to Emerge Stronger for the Downturn You Went In. So this is on the brain. I would hmm. say from zero to 10, it's, I don't think that much changes. You know, most of the really early stage startups I work with, I always say, look, you're trying to get a drink of water from a lake and the lake level may be going up or down, but, but it doesn't matter to you, right? Like, like if you're Walmart, the economy is going to affect you, <laughs> right? 
Yeah, it, definitionally. If you're a little startup who's trying to hit a $1 million new ARR plan, do you really care if the lake level is at 20 feet or 18 feet or 22 feet? Like, it doesn't actually matter for you. So don't worry about it so much. In general, that's my first order answer. My second order answer mm -hmm. is let's, in order to sell this stuff, we need to sell to use cases that people care about. So, so that may have changed, <laughs> right? Your buyer's priorities may be radically different. That matters. But, but whether the lake level doesn't matter for you at all. As you get bigger, it matters more, right? Because you're trying to get more than a drink. You're trying to get a few gallons and, you know, swimming pool. And you're trying to get a lot of water out of the lake. And I think in those cases, it starts to matter. And in those cases, look, the, the fundamental pendulum that's swinging here is, is from growth at all costs to balance growth and profit, uh, which means, you know, it's harder because you're going to need to still grow fast, right? I, I think I saw a statistic that said valuation multiples still correlate pretty strongly to growth rate if your free cash flow is greater than 15%, which is a big if, <laughs> right? So, so, so we still value growth, but, 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 but you need to be at 15% FCF, right? So, so and, and for, definitely that makes the job harder because now, we, you know, it's easier where you can just keep throwing gas and, you know, put the afterburners on and, and go really fast in an inefficient way. So, so I think it's going to be more challenging for management, but I think the, the question is, how do we grow fast and do so profitably? And, and that, that's work. Yep. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. So final question, Dave. So we're bringing Sastock to Austin, Texas in the summer for the first time. Well, just a little bit before summer, because I know it gets super hot in Austin uh, at the summer. Uh, so 31st to, uh, of May to the 2nd of June, uh, Sastock will be at the JW Marriott there. And you're speaking. So we're getting you back. Uh, you did such a great job, I think, as you always do at other conferences and uh, at Sastock. Probably a little bit far ahead. So I'd be pretty impressed if you know what you're going to speak about. But if you do, uh, please do share. And what are you looking forward to uh, with regards to that event? So I have an area I'm thinking about it. I don't have the exact title yet, as, as I think you know. But I want to talk about conversation intelligence for, for, for two reasons. One, it's a space that I've been enormously excited about since forever. Like as soon as it came out, the first demo I saw, I had a couple of reactions. One, this is magic. Like I didn't know we could do this. And two, this could connect the C-suite to reality because – in my opinion, in a lot of startups, the C-suite gets disconnected from reality very quickly. And, and you know, before tools like Onchorus, you, you could listen to sales calls, you would just show up and listen, or you could record them and, and listen to them later. But you didn't have a really nice tool to help you do that. And when you listen to sales calls, I work with one company, I'll give you an example. I work with one company where, where they created a category and they they got so used to evangelizing the category that when the market changed and people called them and said, I'm going to buy a schmumble, right? They used to have to say, hey, here's why you need to buy a schmumble. But now people are calling saying, I'm going to buy a schmumble. And Gartner told me to evaluate you and these two competitors. Can you tell me why I should buy yours? And the company would answer with, here's why you need to buy a schmumble. And if you listen to sales calls, you could hear that, right? So, so Gong is great more tactically for helping individual reps with their pitch and training and onboarding. But, but these tools... They, they help, in my mind, the strategic value is to connect the E-suite to reality because you can be like, oh, my God, the market's changed on us. People, we're answering the wrong question. So, so, the, so the two reasons I like it are, one, I've helped so many startups with just saying, put in a conversational intelligence tool, listen to what's happening, and then make your plans because you're disconnected from what's actually happening. The other reason is I recently joined the board of Jiminy which is a UK-based conversational intelligence company, right? And, and I joined, I don't like CI because I'm on the board of Jiminy. I joined Jiminy because mm -hmm. I like CI, right? <laughs> yeah. So understand cause and effect. So I'm going to talk something about how to leverage conversational intelligence because I think it can really help with that challenge we just discussed, which is how do we grow, but it's harder, right? We can't just grow. We need to grow efficiently. So how do we do yeah. that? And I think listening to reality, I, I, this is the marketing guy, market research, understanding things. The more we understand about how those things go down, the better we can optimize them. Awesome. Ever been to Austin before? I have. I love Austin. It's a great town. Yeah. What's, uh, what's one thing that somebody should do in Austin? Oh, I guess you got to eat barbecue. I mean, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you haven't been to Texas, uh, in general, you have to eat barbecue. Uh, and they have great kind of these huge outdoor barbecue restaurants. Uh, so, so try and get a group of people and go do that. This is, this is what I'm worried about, but in, in, a, in a good way, Dave. That I, like, I, I'm a real foodie 
it, it can be detrimental because my, like certainly my my weight goes uh, up and down and my eyes are much bigger than my stomach so I kind of feel like when I come close to a conference because I, I, I do you know I'm on stage a bit and you know doing a lot of video I'm trying to slim down and lose weight but I think like if I'm going to be in Austin like a week before the event I'm going to be eating all this barbecue and I'm just going to be putting on so much weight but you know whatever will be will be but I, I, I'm looking forward to it uh, so the good stuff well look, Dave uh, thanks so much for being a great guest. I'm glad we got to to do this, and uh, looking forward to publishing this. Uh, looking for, I'm sure we'll we'll speak before Austin, but seeing you in, uh, in, in at SAS.USA. Thanks so much, Dave Kellogg. Where can people find you online? Kellblog dot com, k e l l b l o g dot com, and Twitter at Kellblog. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dave. Have a great rest of your day, and thanks again for being on the SAS Revolution Show. Thanks, Alex. Great being here.